I have to say, I had some misgivings about accepting the invitation because when I heard this was for a university, I thought there was a sort of assumption that the speaker knows something about his subject, you know, to a certain <laughs> level of knowledge. And I thought, well, do I have enough knowledge to entertain you tonight? Um, but then Susan said, passion is enough. And I'm certainly passionate about this subject, this Western Capricale that I'm going to talk to you about shortly. And failing the passion, the photographs I've got are excellent. So, <laughs> you know, hopefully you're going to be entertained. What, what we're going to do for you, um, I think I'm going to speak for about a quarter of an hour, maybe just a few minutes more, um, beginning to talk about the extinct project and, and working down that list of... Uh, Hopefully interesting items about the Capricale, and then, then Annie's going to come in at the end and, and raise the intellectual threshold of the evening by, by stimulating you some questions for the discussion. Um, so I hope that's, that's going to be of uh, interest for you all. How, how many of you have heard of Extinct Project before being invited here tonight? Well, I knew, I knew you have, Kate. <laughs> Quite a few of you. I mean, I think even the name itself, Ex Inked, is incredibly clever, isn't it? I mean, it's um, Ultimate Holding Company have, I think, got a reputation for taking what is a, a cause which maybe hasn't just failed to ignite the public's imagination and then putting a different slant on it and making people stop and take notice. And I think this idea of bringing together arts and ecology, and particularly tattooing and ecology, is really powerful. And I'm, I'm really pleased to have been chosen as one of the 500 people to be uh, selected and I'm sure Annie is as well. In fact Charles Darwin's 200th birthday was a year of this project and I'm sure he would have been up here if he could have been. I'm not sure what species he would have been tattooed with if he had have been. Um, so we've got a hundred endangered species. Jay Redman uh, studied them, he drew them and they're, in, they're in all in this book. It's the kind of limited edition book which I've got. I'm, I'm going to pass it around as I speak. So just flip through it and see. You can see all the other pictures that we've got. And uh, I think Susan, I was looking through it earlier, and I'm, I'm just very glad I got the Capricale and not some of the other ones that I might have had in here. <laughs> so I'll, I'll pass that around. Um, so there were 500 people came forward and. 100 were selected, and Annie and I were two of those, two of, just two of those people. So we, we feel very privileged to have been so. I've never had a tattoo. Have lots of people in here had tattoos? I know you have, Annie. <laughs> Barely any, nobody's had a tattoo in here. It's astonishing. I thought, what's their hands would go up? Well, it was my first tattoo, and this is a picture of, of how it happened. It was um, industrial tattooing. <laughs> we were Friday night, Saturday, Sunday. Three tattoo artists working through a hundred people, one after the other. Well, actually, three at a time it was, isn't it? And what that did is it started to bring the, the ambassadors together as a kind of camaraderie amongst us as being something different, because we were all there together in, in this kind of futuristic setting. Um, and the result was, was, I think, what Extinct were hoping for was this kind of what they call an army of ambassadors. Um, but certainly the, the, the aim now is to move away from the tattoos. The tattoos are great, and, and I'll do private showings later if, if anybody <laughs> wants to see one. Uh, any excuse. The, the, the idea is to move away from the tattoos now and focus on education, and focus on what the ambassadors can actually do about their species. And so that's why I was really pleased tonight to be able to accept the invitation and say, well, here I am. It's about education. It's about raising awareness of, of what I think is an absolutely wonderful bird which is incredibly endangered at the moment. Um, this is the artist, this is Jay Redman, who, who drew all the uh, tattoos. Um, it's an 1880s stuffed capercaillie in the, in the Manchester Museum, and it's a very sinister looking ambassador. <laughs> sinister being the word my wife used to describe me on that picture. <laughs> um, so, this is the tattoo. Tetrao Eulogallus. I don't know if people know what that means. It's uh, a game bird, Tetrao, and Eulogallus means a chicken with a big tail. Uh, Capricale is, is obviously Gaelic for um, uh, horse of the forest, horse of the woods. Not, and horse means in Gaelic anything big. So, so, no, Capricale is, a, is a, big, a big bird. So you can compare now the 
a drawing with the actual bird. Um, the drawing's the one on the right. Uh, it's a beautiful bird, isn't it? It's it's a member of the, it's a grouse. It's a member of the grouse family. For everybody who sees my tattoo, the amount of people to say, why have you got a big black turkey tattooed on your shoulder? <laughs> I just want to say it's not a turkey, it's a grouse. The turkey is, is, is equally beautiful apart from its face, which I think we all know is not particularly attractive, but the capercaillie has got an adorable face, I think. Um, vicious. It's, it is actually very vicious. Uh, it, that, that bill is so powerful and sharp, it can cause real damage, and, and they do attack humans, as I'll, I'll say a bit later. But the blue and green of the plumage is, is stunning, the colour of a pine forest that it lives in. And uh, it's got, as I say, beautiful plumage, and it's got that kind of red wattle around the eye that's typical of the, the grouse family. Interesting fact about the, the capercaillie is it. it in winter, because it spends all its time on the pine trees in Scotland, its feet grow so it can cling on more. Now, the person who told me about that wasn't around for me to ask him what happens in spring. Do they sort of shrink back again? Or does every winter these feet get bigger and bigger so a very old capricorn have got huge feet? I don't know that, but anyway, feet grow in winter to, to hang onto the tree. And then, interesting fact about the female capricorn, um, when they're sitting on the nest, incubating the eggs, they, their metabolism changes, so they give off no scent at all, and they, they stop producing droppings, which is a great way to sort of hide themselves, of course. The male capercaillie, the, the, the wingspan is 1.2 metres, it's, it's a big bird, the female's two and a half times smaller in, in weight and size, but the male capercaillie is a, is a big so-and-so, and I've, I've really come to admire this bird. In fact, I identify with this bird now. I've kind of got a lot in common with this bird. <laughs> I, I work in mental health. <laughs> and this, this bird is, suffers with stress. <laughs> and it doesn't just suffer with stress, it, it actually does suffer with depression. And seriously, it does. It's caused by the inbreeding, because there's so few birds to breed with. So actually, it has been proven to us suffer with depression. It's shy and it's incredibly retiring. You, you don't see capercaillie. But you wouldn't get a capercaillie up here speaking to you, except in April and May, when the male capercaillie has a kind of transformation and becomes a six-pack of the bird world. It becomes full of testosterone, it becomes macho, and it gets out there. And in that, in that state, it will, as I say, attack anything that gets in its way. It's vegetarian, which is another good thing, and the sound it makes is the sound of a wine cork popping out of a bottle, which I think is it endears itself to me as well. <laughs> my second prop of the evening is, is, is my, my toy cafe Kaylee from the RSPB. So that's the sound of the cafe Kaylee, and I hope I'll continue to hear it as I carry on speaking as we go, go through. Um, <laughs> it's optional actually, you don't have to press it. I was asked to say why I became an ambassador, so, um, well, I mean, a simple answer is a midlife crisis, I think. I, like many of you, I hadn't had a tattoo, I'd never had a piercing, and I was going, heading towards 50, and I thought, <laughs> I really want a tattoo, and every idea I had, and I hope my children would be here today, but they couldn't face it, I don't think. <laughs> but every idea I had, they said, no, Dad, don't go there. And then I saw the article in the paper about this project, and I thought, it's absolutely perfect. It's conservation that I'm passionate about. It's, it, it's about a, a bird which lives in Scotland, up in the mountains. It's about nature. You know, it, it ticked all the boxes for me, but it ticked one particular box, which was... Um, this one, my, my dad died a couple of years before I had the tattoo, and he was an ornithologist. He, he, he enjoyed finding birds and bird spotting. And uh, he used to talk to me about going up to Scotland to find the capercaillie. And I always remember him coming back and saying he hadn't found it. So I'd always stuck in my mind to describe this bird to me. So 
So when I saw the Capricale in, I thought, I've, I've just got to have that tattoo. I should have said to my dad that Capricale live in pine forests, and that's probably why I didn't find them when he was up there. He was on top of a mountain, but, but I'm sure he knows that anyway. But. So where, where, are, where do you find the Capricale? Well, not many, not many places. The, the main area is Speyside, which is that, that bit south of uh, Inverness, or so, to the bottom, that way from Inverness. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean, don't you? That big green bit in the middle. 75% of the birds are in that area, and that's because the RSPB support the Abernethy Reserve, which is a managed area, and the birds survive in that area. In those other areas, there's maybe, D side is 20 male birds, that's all. I mean, they're down to tiny, tiny numbers. In the, um, it was the 18th century they became extinct in, in, in this country, in Scotland. They were reintroduced in the 19th century, and in the 1950s, there were 50, 60, 70,000 of them in Scotland. By 1970, it was down to 20,000, and it is now down to around about 1,000 left. That's all, all, all we've got left. The numbers are holding up because of what I'm going to say next, which is about the conservation efforts that are going on. Um, I should say they're not endangered internationally. And lots of people say to me, well, what's the problem then? Well, I think there is a huge problem if we lose a bird that's native to our country. Um, they are endangered in Spain, they're critically endangered in Spain, but in our country, they, they uh, it's, our, our, but bird in Scotland is a Scandinavian subspecies, and, and that, because there's many in Scandinavia, it's not seen as being endangered, but of course it is in Scotland. Um, and that's one of the reasons why they they used to be hunted. So who, who knows about who's heard of the lack? This is one of the things that Capricale are famous for. Sue's put her hand up. Lacking. I know you do, know, Margaret. Yeah. Well, if you want to know what the lack is, think about the the Ritz on a Saturday night in, in Manchester. Because a, a lack is when a gathering of males come together for the purpose of competitive mating display. So it's kind of like Saturday night out in Manchester. <laughs> but the difference is, that in, for the Kappa Kappa, the winner takes it all. The alpha male mates with all the females. And uh, so there's a bit of competition amongst the, the male birds for that, uh, for that honor. And this is, this is how a lek works. All the capicale come from their territory and they meet in this, this lecking area in the middle. Sorry, you can't see that, can you? I want a bit in the middle. And they make sound and they dance and they strut and the sound carries for kilometers and all the females come and watch what's going on. And then gradually the males start to fight each other. And the one with the most testosterone, the most aggression, the biggest noise, um, wins, as it were. Becomes the alpha male. And this picture's gorgeous, isn't it? I mean, that's, that's the capicale in the lacking season, jumping up, making a display. And when they do attack you, as this gentleman said, they, they, you know, there's a wonderful YouTube video, David Attenborough and the capicale. Google capicale and David Attenborough, and you'll see how the, the David, David Attenborough fell over as the capicale advanced on him. <laughs> they, they attack cars and all sorts in this state of mind. And then these next two photographs, I think they're lovely because they just show the, the, the male capicale strutting. Um, you can almost see him smoking his cigar, can't you, after that? <laughs> but actually, it's very rare to see birds, the bird on the ground. They, they, they almost always are up in the trees, which is where, where you'll, you'll find them. So the question I sort of want to, want to pose is, do we, do we want the capicale to go the same way as other big birds have done in, in this country, the crane and the busted and the bittern? Or, or similar endangered? Do we want to lose this bird or, or do we want to fight to keep it? Um, so I just want to talk about the reasons why the decline is going on and then something about conservation before I, I finish. Um, the reasons for the decline, poor breeding, lovely baby Capricale there. 2007-2008, um, very wet, very wet springs, bad news for the chicks. The chicks get chilled and wet, and they don't survive. So 2012, of course, the key, crucial time is May, May and June. We've just had the wettest June, so I suspect it's not a good year again for Capricale. Um, and the vegetation isn't, is, 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 is impaired by the climate change. Sorry, that's my next slide. 
Um, so, the, so the females don't, don't get the nutrients they need to prepare themselves for, the, for their breeding. Um, but then the other big reason is, is, is the predators that feed on them. And this is really interesting. The, the, the capigo have gone down as the foxes have gone up. But the foxes can be controlled. The crows can be controlled. Stoats can be controlled. But that one in the bottom right corner there is, is, is the pine martin. And the pine martin is another endangered species. In fact, there's a pine martin in that book going around. Somebody has been tattooed with a pine martin. And it's a pine martin that's eating many of my capicaeli. <laughs> and because there's only three and a half thousand pine martin, they're protected. So you have to be extremely cunning how you stop the, cap the pine martins from predator predating on the, on the capicaeli chicks. But the, I mean, the main reason, I think, is that the habitat is out of sync, is out of kilter due to the impact humans have had on it. That's, that's the fundamental reason why predation is such a problem. You get these big expanses of open forest, and that's good for the predators, it's not good for the capicaeli. Um, it's the overgrazing which destroys the habitat that the capicaeli need, the brood habitat. As I say, these expanses of forest with huge gaps in between stop the capicaeli coming together and, uh, and breeding. So habitat is a huge, a huge issue. And the other big one, of course, is, is the impact that we have, people and dog management. And when I spoke to one of my experts who, who, who kind of helped me with this, she said, the message you give to people is, if you're up in Scotland, in, in, particularly in April, May, June, don't let your dogs off the lead because they cause havoc with the capicaeli. So I've given that message, I said I would. Now this picture is my picture and I'm really proud of it. I've only put it in because I think it's a gorgeous picture. <laughs> this, this is a Cairngorms in the background and this is where, when we went up to Scotland to look for the capicaeli, we found, I found the capicaeli, which was amazing. It's astonishing. It's a story there, but I haven't got time to tell you it. But they, they live just, just next to this forest here. In terms of conservation, Deer fences, incredibly bad news for Capicaeli. They kill so many birds. I did some research 10 years ago and they said if you uh, mark the fences, I'll just show you what marking the fences mean, this kind of motorway tape. Mark the fences or take the fences out. You'll reduce the numbers of Capicaeli being killed by the fences by 65%. So they did that, they took away 130 kilometres, no, they marked 130 kilometres and took away 87 kilometres of fencing and the Capicaeli numbers held up. It had a big impact. But interestingly, the Scottish gamekeepers have a website and being the researcher I am, I went on it and the Scottish gamekeepers say this, the RSPB cannot be trusted. The RSPB are willing to sacrifice Capicaeli and what they mean by that is that they say the RSPB cannot afford to put out there that the real cause of the decline of the Capicaeli is a pine martin. So what they're saying is it's these fences that are causing the damage. And of course the gamekeepers want the fences. So there's a difference of opinion between this, this, this to the... Uh, I'll say no more than that. But what can we do in terms of conservation? Just press on, I've got to be quick. We can create these natural structures, these areas of glades in the forest. Um, what you're trying to do is create these natural boreal forests, a coniferous forest that the birds will do well in. Um, Semi-natural forests you're hoping to establish, which semi-natural meaning that they're, that they're planted naturally, they're not, they're not planted by people, they grow from seed. So you get this different age of tree and different density and so on. And enrichment planting, so you plant trees within other trees, so you grow cover for the capicaeli. And an obvious one, you close the tracks so you make more area inaccessible for, for people to get to, to support the capicaeli. So those are all ways that you can do things. And this is the final part of conservation. I think this is fantastic. If you, there's an area that what they're trying to do is grow the forest in, in Scotland. Grow it. And I, I work to a five-year commissioning strategy in my, my job. Sometimes it's a 10-year one, but for the RSP being a forestry commission, I have a 200-year plan which is to double the size of the forest. So if I was a project manager working on that, with a bonus at the end of it, I'd be a bit, a bit, a bit, hard, to, a bit hard to achieve, I think. 
But the idea is, of course, to, to, to regenerate the forest and connect the forest up. And if they can do that in 200 years in Abernethy, then we'll, we'll have a good chance of the Kapakawi surviving. So what can Ambassador do, pressing on? We can get to know our subject, which I've tried to do. This is our field trip. Uh, we went up to found the Kapakawi project officer in Scotland, and he took us around some managed forest land, and he started to show us what we need. That's... Do you recognise yourself, Sue? You had your hair dyed since, haven't you? <laughs> um, he showed us some interesting things. That's a Kapike with claw. It's incredibly uh, sharp and powerful. Kim's looking suitably impressed. <laughs> he showed us the, 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 the bleeberry and, the, and the, the new pine shoots that the Kapike we need to eat. And he showed us Kapike with droppings, which is great. The male Kapike with droppings is a bit like a small cigar. And the female is like a cigarette in terms of size, different size. So we studied the Kapakawa droppings, and that was how we managed to find the Kapakawa. Because I, I saw these droppings, I said, that's Kapakawa dropping. We, we, we went on a Kapakawa trip, and we came across a bird. It took off before we could see it, but it was in that dust bowl. And it took off, and we could, you, you hear Kapakawa before you see them, because they are so shy, that they just disappear. And it just went off into the trees, making a huge noise. And, and that's Chris there, he's sort of saying it went that way somewhere. <laughs> it's, it's in there somewhere, but I can't see it now. Um, so, just finishing now. I mean, if you're interested in the Kapakaili, which I hope you are after what I've said, I've, I've set up uh, a Friends of the Kapakaili Manchester branch, okay? I've now got a, around about 100 people signed up. And I ask people to pay two pounds a year, so it's not the money that matters, and give me an email address. And in return, you'll get four or five emails every year with news about the Kapike, like the odd photograph. And the, these are some examples of the newsletters that you get sent to you if you join my Friends of the Kapike vote. And I'm going to send those around. There's three different ones there. So just pass them around. If you want to get those emailed to you, join my f friends group. That's the proof that I do actually send the money in. I've sent in about £800 in, in the... This is the third year that I've done it now. Um, so let me know afterwards. All I need is an email address and £2. Finally, I just want to acknowledge and thank the people who, who helped me with this, because I think Kappa K with project officers are getting younger every day, aren't they? I mean, he's, a, he's a lovely guy, but he, he was really helpful to us, and he, he's provided me most of the pictures that I've used tonight. And he wanted me to acknowledge Desmond, who, who did some of the, the photographs. So thank you very much, Tim. And finally, I just want to thank... <laughs> it's a classic picture, that, isn't it, to finish with? That, that, that was taken on, a, on one of these cameras that, where you... It's a long exposure, isn't it? About 10 seconds. So you can't... 19th century. So you can't smile or anything, you can't hold a smile for 10 seconds, can you? So you've got to look really soon. And it looks like I've just shot it, doesn't it? That's one of those Russian Kapakali that lives in a drawer in the museum and never comes out. It's um, from 1870, a Russian market. And that's Henry McGee, who should really have been speaking to you tonight because he's a font of knowledge of a Kapakali and helped me enormously, but he couldn't come tonight. So that's all I've got to say. Thank you very much.